And now, a call of Cthulhu Mystery Program News Bulletin. We're joined in the studio by series showrunner Cat Blackard. Hello, friends. It's a pleasure to be back on your airwaves once again, and with some exciting things to share. I come to you today with an update about the Call of Cthulhu Mystery Program's next season, how you can help bring it to life, and a new immersive RPG audio drama from us folks here at Omniverse. Stick around and I'll give you the skinny on Kate Was Here, one of the most incredible role-playing experiences of my life. Now, as you may recall from our last bulletin, our crowdfunding campaign for the next series of our show ended, and from that we received a little over half of the funding that we need to complete it. But we are soldiering onward. With the help of our patrons on Patreon and subscribers of Fable and Folly Plus, we're working towards the additional funding we need while also starting work on the next series, The Case of the Penumbral Gate, and a remaster and expansion of our debut series, The Black Birth. It's going to be a slow process, but with your continued support, we remain confident that we'll make it. And if you missed out on our crowdfunding campaign, it's not too late to get in on the action. From now until March 15th, 2023, you can head to CthulhuMystery.BackerKit.com and get one last chance at the exclusive experiences and occult items offered through our crowdfunding campaign. We've got wooden red herring coins for players who do a good job of chasing down bad leads, discounted pre-orders of our first original Call of Cthulhu role-playing scenario, The Terrible Secret of Lot X, mystery boxes of unusual and uncanny items, private Call of Cthulhu sessions for you and your friends run by Keeper Luke Stram, tarot readings by yours truly, and much more. These are things we are very excited to provide, but for those of you who more than anything just want to see the next season come out faster, well, you can also give us a one-time donation. Again, that's CthulhuMystery.BackerKit.com from now until March 15th. If you contributed to our crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo and this is the first you're hearing about BackerKit, that's the platform we're using for all our reward fulfillment. And in recent weeks, you should have received a survey to fill out so we can get you your rewards, be they digital or physical. If you haven't seen the survey, well, check your inbox, check your spam folder, or for a direct line of your survey, head to CthulhuMystery.BackerKit.com and input your email address. When in doubt, you can always reach out to us, hop on over to our Discord server at omniverse.media slash discord, or email us at omnivox at omniverse.media. And friends, followers, acolytes, kind folks, if you're able to fund our production long term, or would like to be in the know about how our show is made, we'd love if you'd join us on Patreon. I publish weekly updates on what we're working on. And patrons get early ad-free releases of all of our shows, as well as exclusives like Cthulhu Cthomentary, our behind-the-scenes show where we unpack all the strange historical facts, Lovecraftian references, and secrets hidden in Mystery Program. Right now, we're working our way through our latest series, Night at Howling House. And, by listener request, I've recently released all my story notes for that series, so, if you'd like to play the dare with all the changes to the characters and plot that we created, we've got you covered. Have a look at all the exciting stuff that we've got in store at patreon.com slash omniverse media. You know, here at Omniverse, we're always hard at work exploring new dimensions in role-playing, collaborative storytelling, and immersive audio adventures. So I'm very very, very, very excited to share with you our latest breakthrough. We've developed a new kind of role-playing experience called Surprise RPGs. In a Surprise RPG, role players embody normal people caught up in their own everyday narratives until they are suddenly sideswiped by an even bigger adventure and are viscerally thrust into cinematic scenarios. We've developed this method over the past three years and found that these games result in deeply personal experiences and uniquely powerful storytelling. Our first experiment in surprise RPGs is called Kate Was Here. It's a duet between myself, the player, and game master, Doug Banks. It's about the strange life of Kate Ritchie, AKA Kate, spelled the letter K and the number eight. She's a high school journalist with a knack for putting her nose where it doesn't belong. Sinister things are going down in her hometown and Kate intends to get to the bottom of it. But of course, that's just the start of the story. What happened next is 
no exaggeration, one of the most profound experiences of my life. If you love mind-bending, pulpy sci-fi, join me for the wildest collaborative storytelling adventure I've ever been on. You can find Kate Was Here, not in the usual places you find podcasts. It's on YouTube. Strange, I know. But there's a good reason for that. I'd tell you, but uh, it'll spoil the surprise. You can find Kate Was Here at katewashere.com. That's letter K, number eight, was here. Dot com. There you can listen to the entire limited series presented with optional video accompaniment. And while you're there, it certainly couldn't hurt to subscribe to the Surprise RPG YouTube channel, should, you know, any further developments manifest themselves. We have many more Surprise RPG audio dramas in the works and additional completed series currently available on our Patreon. I know the YouTube thing is highly unusual, but trust me, Though it is by unconventional means, it's a ride I think you're going to want to take. Hi, Doug. Hey. (laughs) What we're about to do is some kind of experiment. I've had a couple ideas on some role-playing scenarios and games and systems that I wanted to try out, but the very nature of what I wanted to do was a unique kind of storytelling using a role-playing game for a solo player. Apparently there's already a term for this in Dungeons and Dragons called a duet. Oh, and I like I, that. I like that a lot too. I hadn't heard about that until like literally the day before yesterday. So apparently duets in D&D are a thing, but not like a big thing. There's a lot of stigma about one player RPGs where you have a GM and one player. Where's the stigma come from? Is that sort of aggrandizing the way things are meant to be done, or...? I'm not sure, really. I think a lot of his holdover from back when Dungeons & Dragons and role-playing games in general were already stigmatized as being super nerdy. Uh But at least, hey, at least you're with a group of people, and at least you're being social. But when it's just two people, I can see how from an outside perspective, it's like the two of you just sort of go off in a room and you just like talking characters people until it's something like well yeah but it's if you're making a story here that's how people write yeah. songs yeah that's uh, how that's how people write anything any stories and songs like you say <laughs> but for some reason in role playing it's always got this stigma to it and another thing is that there's a difficulty for a lot of gms who say the pacing is wonky and it's weird because uh, you know it's this and also for players they say if it's just me and the gm it's like am i just living in the gm's fan fiction and they're just going to do all this stuff and there's that's a big danger too but that's also a danger when you're playing with multiple people yeah um so there's a lot of so not a lot of people apparently have really i'm sure a lot of, in reality the number wise a lot of people have done it but online when i was looking people are either really shy about it had mixed experiences with it no one ever had a really positive experience outside of those who say a dm who was trying to get their uh spouse or loved one interested and warmed them up to it by playing a few rounds like leveled up their D character from like levels one to five and then when they were up to level five then they would join the regular party so that sounds like a great idea actually. yeah that, and, that, and that does sound like a good idea but uh, outside of that and mm-hmm. those types of things where it's introducing somebody to role playing which i think if you're introducing somebody to role playing starting them out put them in a room with just you and them, I don't know if that's a great idea. It depends um, on the social dynamics. Yeah, yeah. But because we have such a good social dynamic, and we think in a lot of similar ways when it comes to being creative and storytelling, but we also differ in terms of like what our specialties are, yeah. I think this presented a really unique opportunity to what I was already considering doing as an experiment, and then at including you, your energy into it could either make it a one-time thing that won't work for anyone else, mm-hmm. <laughs> or could at least be a proof of concept for me that I can run a role-playing game for one player and still make it a living, breathing world that doesn't rely too much on the input of the other players. Right. Not that I felt that I was doing that too much, but there are so many things I wanted to try and do, and doing it as a one-player RPG gives a lot of freedom, but also with new restrictions that I haven't had. So Doug tells me, I want to play this one-person game, and I want you to make a normal person, Mm -hmm. a totally normal person, And what we're going to do, this game is going to be derivative of some kind of media property. But I can't tell you what it is. Because if you know what it is, you're going to prepare for it. And the Mm -hmm. example that you gave me was Jurassic Park. Yeah. Like if I I told you, hey, saddle up, we're going to play Jurassic Park, make a character. You'd be like, oh, I'm going to be a paleontologist. Or I'm going to be a security guard expert. Or I'm going to be ex-military. Or I'm going to be whatever. I want to survive Jurassic Park. Right. 
But if I told you instead, that's not how you write a Jurassic Park no, movie. That's not how you. That is well. That's how some people write a Jurassic Park <laughs> movie. But instead, I said, well, wouldn't it be better? I'm saying to myself, okay, that's not how you write a good Jurassic Park movie, yeah. of which there's only one. Right. <laughs> so instead, I want you to write a normal person, and I'll tell you what eventually you're going to go on a contemporary story. And then I say, hey, you, you want a free vacation and you want a uh, trip on a cruise ship down to Costa Rica. Yeah. And you're on this cruise ship and everything is grand and wonderful. And all of a sudden a storm hits and you're thrown overboard and the ship probably sinks. But you don't even know because you wake up washed on an island and it's this like tropical island. And you must be in the Pacific because you don't but you don't remember how you got here. You remember there was a oh, storm. Oh, great. I'm yeah. playing the castaway RPG. Yeah. But then you keep walking in further and you see signs of civilization. Like you see like a small shack that has like uh, electrical stuff inside. Like a fuse box but it's all been overgrown oh, great i'm playing the lost rpg yeah <laughs> and then but then you find a jeep and then you like a jeep wrangler and you go over and it looks like it's been here for like 20 years or 30 years and there's like a bunch of dust and stuff and vines growing over it. and as you pull the vines away and you wipe the mud off the side of the door you see a logo of a skeleton of a tyrannosaurus over the oh, words jurassic no, park i'm playing a jurassic <laughs> park rpg which should be a good thing but i know how ill-equipped i am for exactly this. but but you get that sense of dread of oh my fucking god like like the real you the meta you goes oh no even if the character in game may not even fully comprehend the danger that they're in they're Therefore, you are now emotionally prepared to survive a badass Jurassic Park story or die trying. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the example I gave. And I said, this, so this is another scenario where you are an average person who's going to be put into possibly some extraordinary circumstance. So... I've told you nothing. Yeah. And I've hoped that I haven't let anything slip not, on. Not on in stuff. the least. I have I have legitimately no clue what we're doing. Yeah. But that's part of the the point yeah. of can we create a story and an experience where you're going in completely blind, but yet you'll have a reward on the other end of this that, you know, something. Yeah. So character creation was I mined a bunch of autobiographical pieces of my high school life to create this character. I said your character can be any sex, they can have any gender identity, they can have anything about them, that, but they need to be, what did I say, between the ages of uh, like 16 and uh, 19? Something like that, yeah. And uh, that I would prefer if they were in high school and that this is in contemporary United States and more specifically, it's going to be in the year 2016, so just in a pivotal point politically. Do I know and, what month? Yeah, I'll tell you when we begin. Okay. And at the same time, this isn't our world, but it's a world that is very similar to ours. So there will be like little differences, but the differences aren't really important. And right. if, if something does come up that is important, I'll reveal it to you. There's other things about the town. Well, tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about your character before we launch sure. into it. Her name's Kate Ritchie. When she writes it, it's spelled the letter K and the number eight. She's a junior in high school. She's 17 years old. And she's a photographer. She is generally kind of like known as an eccentric weirdo around the high school. She deals with the arts department, what there is. This is not an artistic town. This is not a town with a lot of culture. Kate recognizes that and uh, is sort of like just waiting to get out some way, somehow. But she does have a pretty substantial photographic eye that has allowed her to perceive the weird, sterile surroundings of where she lives through a lens that other people don't have. She didn't want to be in journalism, but because she's a photographer, that's where she ended up getting sort of sorted. And once she was there, she ended up eventually, didn't take long, becoming a journalist in addition to photography. She mostly has fun with it because she hates writing about school stuff. She wants to write about like more interesting things and uh, is sort of feeling that out, feeling out the experience of being a kid whose parents are divorced who's left alone most of the time, who has a good friend group, who's queer and is trying to figure that out, and who is like because of her talents and the eccentric way that she sort of presents herself, which isn't to say it's particularly strange, it's just like sort of unabashed and notably different and doesn't take shit from anybody. She's about to be a senior. She's going to leave. The world feels like her oyster. Her tiny world hmm. is always new and different but at the same time there's a kind of security in the sorts of adventures she'll have and uh, a bit about the town that you grew up in here before kate was born it was known as a kind of really shitty town but with the dot-com boom in like in the 90s and technology coming in 
uh, there was a small there was a small little cultural revolution in this town where a lot of the crime and the drugs and stuff had been swept out. And instead, basically, the town sold out. It just sold out what space it did have, and it made a lot of tax benefits to any tech companies that wanted to come in. So it became like a small Silicon Valley uh, kind of carbon copy <laughs> of trying to be the place where Amazon would be made. You know, it, it, it wanted to be all these things. And to a certain extent, it did succeed in that. But instead of it being like, you know, Amazon or eBay or, or that kind of thing, it mostly got bought up by security firms and things like that. So sort of the darker side of technology. And it's kind of been rumored among the high school students of Kate's age, because what Kate was born in 1999, yeah. I believe, around all the students and kids her age, there's a lot of like rumors going around town about how that it's really like an experimental Orwellian dystopian nightmare that's only a few years away from them springing the trap on everyone. And everyone feels like they're always being watched because of all these shady companies that are all umbrella companies of umbrella companies of umbrella companies that just it just spreads like so far. This is a contemporary story with some possible slight sci-fi elements. Slight dystopian sci-fi elements, I believe is how I pitched it to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but hopefully optimistic, depending on your choices. This is a long way of just saying that I that I really wanted to do something very different. The way I even built this is very different. Um, we are using the fate accelerated rules, but we're only using like a third of those rules. And I feel like I should probably sidle in here with my experience with fate, which is I've done it once and I didn't care for it. Mm. Everyone always touts the simplicity of it, but something about the oversimplicity of it, and I have no problems working with collaborative narratives, but it feels like I'm trying to drive stick and I don't know how to. Hmm. So it's all just a lot of weird stop and start. I'm like, look, if you want to just flow and you want to build a story with me, we can do that. But now you're throwing these dice in here hmm. and they're not doing anything except making it complicated. But if I'm, say, doing Call of Cthulhu, I have this whole wealth of all the different expertise that my character has. It feels very real. And most of the time, these aren't, these aren't characters with magic. They're people who can, like, operate heavy machinery and shit like that. You right. know, it's very specific. I either need to have no rules whatsoever and just tell the story or I need to have, you know, some very specific broad data. And when it came time to like sit down and even read the fate accelerated, which I recognize is, is like very different from the regular yeah. old fate. Yeah. I still hit this wall where I had a, a visceral knee jerk reaction mm -hmm. to the ways that it broadly presents even character design yeah. where it's like, OK, so make a character and then invent abilities for them yeah. out of nowhere but you haven't played the game yet yeah so how do you know if that's going to be worthwhile you can invent abilities as you go yeah which again it's this is very freewheeling so like all, all the things that you're pointing out are true <laughs> but but there is a different approach and i think it would all depend on who you play with in our case i knew i didn't want to rely on those rules too heavily and you went ahead and like you just sort of you're like i'm gonna suck it up i'm gonna fill out this character sheet i'm like oh you didn't have to do that part you know like oh you didn't have to do this really all i wanted well, was just the and, main numbers like, and and to help me get a, a handle on on the character that we created and then when i was looking at fate of like hey just like turn all this this data that you and doug have created yeah. via talking into game stuff i was like there's no scaffolding here. Yeah. I don't know how to gamify <laughs> this. I'd rather just describe it. Well, and, and, and because you are a normal person. Like, right. The fate is assuming that you got like, oh, I'm like a hacking wizard, you know, or oh, I'm like a, 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 a an actual wizard. You yeah. Know? It's like build your superhero. Yeah. Like what's your powers? And and I'm like, uh. And so, so, <laughs> so instead of doing fate, the first thing I did was I rolled a character for Call of Cthulhu mm. and parsed out all of those stats and everything. And then I did the fate thing because I was like, okay, whew, yeah. I've got my structure now. I feel grounded. So let me now then like cram all of this hard data into this abstract data that is the fate system. But then at the end of the day, it doesn't even matter because we're just telling a collaborative story via whatever the hell you've got worked up here. Yeah. And again, because this is so experimental in nature and I've obviously never played with anyone else before, I don't know how many dice rolls I'm going to ask from you. I don't yeah. know if we're going to have a ton. I don't know if we're going to have a little or, or none at all. I don't know how important the dice rolls will be when they happen. I think it's all going to depend on how your character decides to react. If they decide that something's super important and worth doing or reacting to. I don't know. I'm, I'm so anxious about this because it is so outside my wheelhouse. But that's why it needs to be done. Yeah. So another component of this crazy experiment is that um, I'm going to be trying to play sound effects and music like live like live to tape like as you were hearing it i'm going to be over here pushing buttons altering levels uh picking out songs to give this like uh vibe 
throughout the whole thing. Well, that's a lot. How are you even doing that? Well, um, I'm uh, I have songs picked out like MP3s, and I have other sound effects. Some I've created from scratch. But actually, oh, it's actually important to note that for a lot of the sound beds and ambience, and even some music, I'm going to be utilizing audio from tabletopaudio.com. I love tabletopaudio.com. I use it all the time in games that I don't record like this. Um, I use it when I'm writing and stuff, and you can customize your own soundboard with different ambient uh, beds yeah. of music and I've stuff. I've heard you mention that you play with atmospheres sometimes in other games that aren't the ones we do for Omniverse. Yes, absolutely. But for this, to get me even more out of my comfort zone to really you know stretch these muscles and try and get better as a GM in, in other places that I don't normally go, I'm going to attempt to play and edit on the fly live ambient music sound effects, background, everything, as it happens. Cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to be easy, but I, again, I, and I know I'm going to fumble, so just bear with me, but I, I think uh, it, at the very least it should prove an interesting brain exercise for me, so even though no one's going to hear what's going on in my brain, maybe you'll hear my panic <laughs> somehow, like where I'm jumping around, and I'm going to try not to get too distracted you by really it. You really are going all in in this like, one-man storyteller experience thing. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, again, I, w- I, I, need, I wanted to really push the limits of what I thought I could do. Like As soon as I said in my own head, like, oh, I could never do that, too, at the same time. I couldn't focus on telling a great story and entertaining people while at the same time juggling sound effects and have it not, you know, go correctly it's it's like well as soon as i told myself i can't do that that's not cool so i need to do it and this is a safe place to fuck up so um so why not safe place yes one last thing about the process for creating this if you want to see all the character sheets and everything they're attached to this episode's posting on patreon i'll include kate's fate accelerated sheet which we're using for this game and the Call of Cthulhu sheet, which we're not using. That's just for, for fun to see like what my process was. And Doug and I collaborated on a document about Kate and her world to establish a base for everything that I would know at the start of this game. So that's attached too. Now, I, I don't know what you had in mind for how this thing opens, but what if we opened with, like an, an article by Kate about the town that kind of streamlines all that info we created into one piece, like an article that could be in the student newspaper? There's actually a chance to role play that if you wanted to go off the cuff on that, or if you want to save it and just I, put it in later if this is something. I was thinking about like the title crawl is Kate reading her noiry, smarmy take on then, the hot then, take on the town. Then if you want to riff on that, let's just do that because um, this can lead into how the game was going to begin, which was just like a standard day at school. So this is what you wrote like before you went to bed, before you crashed on your laptop. Uh huh. And so, 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 as you as you were like zoning out at the end of the night, you're gonna close your laptop and go to bed. What was it that you wrote? It me, Jughead in Riverdale. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you want to get the scoop from Kate about the sordid things happening in her hometown and get this adventure started, we'll see you in episode one of Kate Was Here. That's all for now, lovely listeners. We'll be back with occasional bulletins and more news from the mystery program and Omniverse Frontlines as it develops. And now, back to your regularly scheduled program. Thank you.